Hello, uh, I am uh, Rui Cardoso, Senior Lecturer for Aerospace Engineering. So uh, this face you are seeing there is my face <laughs> and I'm going to um, um, introduce you to statics. So I'm going to, to show you some sample lectures and tutorials on uh, statics. So if you want for some reason to email me uh, with any query, you have my email address here. And uh, you also have these uh, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, things for Brunel, which you can try to follow. Um, so what I'm going to cover in these uh, sample lectures and tutorials is basically material for uh, your year one at Brunel. So I'm going to cover statics only. Of course, you are going to do many other things, but the main main topics I would like you to to focus is basically the, the first three vector analysis I'm going to give a very quick review of vector analysis with the basics and then I'm going to move to equilibrium of a particle where a lot of vector analysis is required and then I will introduce moment produced by a force vector so these are quite basic and but extremely important concepts that you need to know very well for uh, the remaining of your lectures. Uh, then I will move to uh, the equilibrium, uh, sorry, equivalent system force moment, where you will learn how to basically build an equivalent system that is uh, in the same equilibrium conditions as the original system. That will be very important for the topic that follows, which is equilibrium of rigid bodies, uh, which is the main, uh, the main uh, topic in statics. We, we, will study, okay, we will study many different types of supports. The, the bodies or the, the, the rigid bodies, they need to have supports. They cannot be levitating in the air. Uh, and then we are going to learn how to replace those supports with uh, forces, which are called reactions. And we are going to learn how to derive the equilibrium equations. Uh, basically, these equilibrium equations will, will um, make sure that your body is in, is in equilibrium. And then from those equilibrium equations, you can calculate many different unknowns. Uh, then we will talk a little bit about beams. Uh, we will derive the transverse shear force and bending moment diagrams for beams. So this is a kind of a introductory, uh, introductory uh, video I will have for all these sample lectures. Of course, uh, different lectures will have this same introductory video, but they will refer to different topics on this table of contents, if you want. Uh, another thing you can, if you are more curious, I, I, I have a YouTube channel which you can, if you are interested of course and curious, you can try to see what I had there. So I have a, a lot of lectures in that YouTube channel so you can search for that channel by googling, googling Ricardozo YouTube. Uh, I have lectures for more advanced years uh, so I recommend at this point you not to see those lectures. But um, uh, I also have some supporting material for uh, statics in year one there in YouTube channel. So I think it's a, it's a nice thing for you to, to see as well. I would like also to say that all the examples I will be doing in these lectures and tutorials, uh, not all of them, but uh, many of them were taken from these recommended books I have listed here in this slide. So engineering mechanics statics from Ebler or from vector mechanics for engineers statics from Beer and Johnson uh, from engineering mechanics statics from Marion Bolton and Craig and also from my own book stress analysis for lightweight structures a MATLAB oriented approach so all the examples you will see in the videos sometimes I refer which book I've taken the example sometimes I don't but these are the books that we uh, the, uh, sorry that I, I I follow so in case I forget to mention which book I took the example you have here the list of books uh, so you you know where they came from
Right, thank you. So we will move now uh, to the specific lecture. All right, so we'll start with the definition of a vector. You all know what is a vector? You all know what is the difference between a vector and a scalar? Yeah? So, for example, imagine something like this. Imagine, can you see what I'm doing? Yeah. Imagine I have this vector here, A, which usually we represent with a narrow, a subscript, a narrow like this. What is the information this, this vector gives me? Uh, first, it gives me information regarding the magnitude. or also known as intensity. Okay? So basically the magnitude or intensity is the norm or if you want the length of the vector, something like this, right? So this, the length of this vector gives me the intensity. For example, if this is a force, imagine I tell you this vector A the, the magnitude or intensity is 500 Newton, for example, right? So the length of this vector will give me this 500 Newton. If it is a velocity, this length will give me the, the speed, right? Which is a scalar. But the vectors, they also give us extra information. They give us direction, very good, right? They also give us the direction. Imagine, for example, you have this body here. You apply this force A in this direction, and in the same point, you apply force A in this other direction. So these two vectors, they have the same magnitude, but their direction is different, right? So the impact of these two vectors in this body will be different because of the direction of the vector, right? So that is a very important uh, thing as well. Another information the vectors have is the application point, right? The application point is the point where this vector is applied. All right? So basically this is the the information that a, a vector carries with it. Magnitude or intensity, direction, and the point where this vector is applied, right? A scalar, the only information that a scalar has is the magnitude or intensity. A scalar has no information about direction, like the vector S, right? So, because of this, uh, because of all of this information that a vector carries, we need to be able to describe this vector in space for the direction, right? I have a vector with a specific direction in space. How do I describe this direction of the vector in space? So in order to do that, I need to have a coordinate system. All right? So let's start the analysis in a, a two-dimensional analysis, in 2D. So imagine I have a vector like, same vector A, for example, like this one, A. I want to describe the orientation or the direction of this vector in space. What I have to do is I need to attach a coordinate system, which in two dimensions we can call this horizontal, horizontal axis the x-axis, vertical axis, the y-axis, okay? And then what we do is we decompose this vector A 
in these two directions, x and y. All right? So decompose means I will draw parallel lines to the coordinate axis, something like this, a parallel line to the coordinate axis y, and a parallel line to the coordinate axis x. Okay? And then what I will have is this component here that I'm drawing in green color is my horizontal or is my x component of my vector a. Still a vector, right? So this a subscript x is the horizontal component of my vector a or the component along my x axis. And this component here is my ay component, which is the, the component of my vector a along the y axis. All right? OK, so this is how we decompose the, the, a vector in a coordinate system. Uh, now, another, another point I want to, to introduce to you is the definition of a unit length vector. So for example, if I define here this vector, I will call this vector i. And then I will say the norm of vector i is going to be equal to 1, or the magnitude or intensity of this vector i is equal to 1. So this is a, what we call a unit length vector that will give me only the direction, right? So if you go back to your, our previous definition of a vector, when you have the magnitude equal to 1, the only information you get from the vector is the direction of the vector, right? So this unit length vector, the information I get from this vector i that you have here, this vector i, the information we get from this vector is the direction only, because its norm or magnitude is equal to 1. And this i vector, unit vector, is known to give us the direction of our x-axis of our uh, coordinate system. Same thing, if I, I can also define a unit length vector defining the direction of my y-axis, this j unit vector, the norm of j also equal to 1, OK? So this unit length vector j gives me the orientation of my y-axis. All right? So why am I doing this? Because now I can say something like this. I can say that my vector A, this one here, our initial vector A that we are studying, can be obtained by the norm of my vector AX. times my unit vector i plus the norm of my vector a y times my unit length vector j. Let's see very slowly what this means. Look at this. What did I tell you about this, the norm of my vector i? It's here, right? It's equal to 1. So if I multiply if I multiply the norm of AX, which is basically this length, right? Is this length. If I multiply this length by a unit 
a vector with a unit intensity, with intensity equal to 1, the result is going to be this length here, right? This length, right? You agree with me? So this, this component here, this term here will have the magnitude, while this component here will have the information regarding the direction of my vector ax, right? So when you multiply these two, we are getting the total information for this vector ax, isn't it? Right? So I can say something like this. I can say that the result of this product, that product that we have here, is going to be my vector ax. Right? Look, this vector ax in green that I have here, as the information, the magnitude is given by this length, while the direction of ax is given by the unit vector i. Right? What about this term here? Look, this component here, the norm of AY gives me this length of my vector along the Y direction, while this unit vector J gives me the direction of my vector in the Y axis, right? So if I multiply these two, the result I have is a y. So conclusion is I can also say that this is equal to a x plus a y. You all agree with me or not? Are you guys are you guys following this? Or am I, if I'm going too fast, please interrupt me, okay? Okay? You are all following this for sure. Okay, good. Now, if you are all following this, I'm going to take this, this, this uh, figure that we have here. Uh, maybe I can find some space here. Let me delete this. All right, so if we look at this figure again, we can see one important thing that is the addition of vectors. So what we did here, we did the uh, algebraic addition of vectors, right? So what you have here is A. So this term, this addition here, we are adding uh, vectors uh, expressed in a coordinate system. So we, we, we can do this like this, right, like we did. But we also can uh, sum two vectors graphically, right? And there are two rules that we can use to add these two vectors graphically. The first one is the parallelogram rule, which I'm going to use this figure. So imagine I want to add, I want to do this. I want to add uh, a, sorry, ax plus a y. Okay? So basically I want to add, to add this vector ax with this vector a y all right the summation of these two vectors and the parallelogram rule tells me what i need to do is so i have vector a x a y these two in green here uh, so i just so let me delete this again so if i draw If I draw a parallel line to AX starting on the tip of AY, same thing, a parallel line to AY starting on the tip of AX. So this point, this intersection point, so what I do now to add these two vectors is I start on 
the origin of this AX, AY, and if I connect to this point, I will get the result of the addition of two vectors, and that result is A. Right? So the parallelogram rule, what you have to do is you just need to draw parallel lines to the two vectors you are adding, and then the intersection point will give you the tip of the uh, result of the summation of these two two vectors, right? So this is the parallelogram rule. So this result is going to be equal to A. Okay? So basically this is the inverse operation of the decomposition of a vector like we did before, <coughs> right? We started this analysis by getting a vector A and decomposing the vector in X and Y axis, right? So the addition is the inverse operation, right? You start with the components of the vector A, AX, AY. You add them together with the, the parallelogram rule. OK? The other rule is the triangle rule, which I can use this new page. So if you have, if you have your vectors AX and AY, if you want to use the, parallel, the triangle rule, what you do is you move this vector let's see if I can do it this way I can you move this vector from that point to the tip of a x and then the res resultant vector from the addition of these two vectors is this one here okay vector a all right so this triangle rule, because you, as you can see, the shape of this geometric construction is a triangle, right? Did you see what I did? For example, imagine now you want to do something like this. So let me go back. Imagine you want to do uh, <coughs> AX, AX vector minus AY. Now, subtraction. If you think this way, we can always write this subtraction something like this. AX plus minus AY. I can do this, right? You all agree? I can do this very easily, right? So basically, why am I doing this? Because I am transforming a subtraction into an addition. And we know how to do the addition of vectors, right? So what I have to do, if you look at this now, what I have to do is I have to get the minus AY, which is the symmetric AY vector. So I have to flip this AY. Let me move this a little bit. So this is going to be minus AY, right? Okay? And now I just need to add these two vectors, AX with minus AY. So I can use the parallelogram rule or the um, triangle rule. So if you use the, parale the parallelogram rule, you get a parallel line here, a parallel line here, and the resultant of the, this addition is this vector here, okay? Right? You follow this or not? OK. Uh, now, uh, let's see now uh, how we can have, uh, add vectors by using these, uh, uh, the vectors described in a coordinate system, all right? at component by component. So, imagine I give you something like this. Uh, first, let me draw here a coordinate system. So this is your y-axis, x-axis. And imagine I give you now two vectors, let's say, vector A 
And let's do in green now vector B. All right? And I want you to do the algebraic addition of these two vectors. So what do you, what you have to do is you have first to obtain vector A. You have to decompose vector A in the x and y direction. You will get here AX, AY. All right, so you, of course, you have the unit length vectors i and j, all right? And then you can say that a vector a is going to be the norm of ax times i plus the norm of ay times j, all right? And you need to do the same for vector b. You need to decompose vector b, you will get bx here, and you will have by here, and then you can say vector b is going to be equal to bx times unit length vector i plus the norm of by times the unit vector j. Okay? And now, how can you add these two vectors? Now you can say that A plus B, the addition of these two vectors. So what we are, go we are going to do is we are going to look at each coordinate axis. So if you look first at the x direction given by this unit length vector i, you will say something like this. You will, you will put here this i direction, giving you the x direction, and then you will add the components, the two components of uh, along the, the, the uh, i direction. You will add them inside this. So basically you will have here ax, norm of ax, plus the norm of Bx, right? Okay? And you need to do now the same thing for the, along the di y direction. So you will need now to say, you will have here something times, sorry, your unit vector along the y direction. And what you have to have here inside is norm of AY plus the norm of BY. Okay? This is how we add these two vectors algebraically, all right? So we saw how to add vectors using the parallelogram rule, the triangle rule, and algebraically, right? By decomposing the vectors along the coordinate axis and adding each component of all the vectors, right? This is going to be very important, why? Because basically, for example, for the equilibrium of a particle, we are going to have a particle with many vectors. In fact, we can do an example now. It's the best way. Imagine, for example, something like this. I give you a particle, okay? Let's say this is particle A. And then I'm telling you something like this. This particle A has a force of, let's say, 1,000 newtons. So this is a vector, uh, and this force is, okay, we will have, we need to have a coordinate system always. We are still working in two dimensions. So this is our coordinate system, and then I, I'm, I'm saying this force 
makes an angle of 45 degrees with my x-axis, right? And then I have another force. Oh, what happened? I have another force, let's say, for example, uh, this force is, let's say, 1500 newtons. This is the magnitude of this force or intensity. And it makes an angle of 60 degrees with my y axis, all right? And then I say something like this. There is a force here, which I will call force F. All right? And this force F, which we don't know the value of this force F, but, and I also don't know the direction of this force F. So this force F makes an angle, which I will say angle alpha, with my horizontal axis, right? So we have a particle, this particle A, which is under the action of three forces. Two forces are completely defined, the direction and the intensity, <coughs> completely defined. But the third force, we don't know the direction, given by this angle alpha, is unknown. And we don't know the intensity of this force F. But the equilibrium of a particle, and we are going to talk more about this, says that in order for the particle to be in equilibrium, the summation of the forces acting on that particle needs to be equal to zero. OK? So this is the equilibrium equation for a particle, which states that in order for the particle to be in equilibrium, the addition or the summation of all the forces in that particle, at the end, that summation needs to be equal to zero. And one very important thing we are saying here is we are adding force vectors. So if you, if you write the force vectors like this, Right? Or, if you want, even better. Right? We saw just before that the force will have a component along the x direction and the plus a component along the y direction, right? So in order for this to be equal to zero, and this is the main difference I want you to pay attention, is the only way this summation of forces is equal to zero is if the x component is equal to zero, and the y component also equal to zero, right? I'm putting here only the norm because in this product that you have here, if the norm is equal to zero, then everything will be zero, right? Along the x direction. All right, so look at this. I wrote the equilibrium equation for the particle to be in equilibrium, to be summation of forces equal to zero. But because these are force vectors, we end up having not one equation, but two equations, two equilibrium equations. One for the components of the forces in the horizontal direction. So I th summation is missing here, right? Um, oops. And the other equation is summation of forces 
along the y direction also needs to be equal to zero. Right? So we end up having two equilibrium equations because this is a two-dimensional problem. Right? We have used a 2D coordinate system. If you are studying the equilibrium in a three-dimensional space, you will end up having three equilibrium equations. All right? As easy as that. So why am I saying this? Because, in fact, this equilibrium equation that we have here, these equilibrium equations, they will solve this problem. Right? So the only thing we need to do for this problem is we need to add all these forces, right? So basically, we need to, to do this summation here of the components along the x direction, summation of the components along the y direction. And then we will, we will have two equilibrium equations for two unknowns, which are angle alpha and magnitude of force F. Two unknowns for two equations. We just solve the system of equations. We get the solution for this problem, all right? So let's do this quite very quickly. So I will copy this to a new page. Copy, paste, here we are. Let me scale this a little bit, all right? So the first thing we need to do is we need to write the force vectors in the x and y direction. Basically, we need to decompose these vectors along the coordinate axis, right? So let's start doing that with our 1,000 Newton's force. So I can, oops, I can write something like this. So for, for 1,000 Newton, we will have what? We will have the x component is going to be equal to, you tell me, what do you think? This force here, what is the horizontal component? Yeah, very good. So 1,000, which is the norm or the magnitude of the force. If I multiply this by cosine of 45 degrees, I get the horizontal component, right? So basically, what I'm doing is I'm projecting the force in the horizontal, or horizontal direction, right? From the Pythagoras theorem for that rectangular triangle, you understand that is equal to 1,000 cosine 45 degrees, right? Now, this is the horizontal component, or if you want, this is going to be my a, uh, x component, right? Now, I need to project in the vertical direction to get this component, right? Are you following? So you tell me, how much is that? Sine, right? So 1,000 sine. 45 degrees. I can see that you guys know how this works. The reason why I'm doing this very slowly is because my experience from previous years is that you guys struggle with these vectors. Right? If you master vectors, this is going to be no problem, this model for you. Right? So that's why I'm trying to do this very easy. It can be a bit boring now. I know. I can read your faces. But Trust me, this is really, really important, OK? So try to understand these concepts, because they will facilitate everything. All right, so we have this. So this is this force vector. But one thing we are doing not right is we are not putting here the, the unit vectors, right? So we need to say this is my component along the x direction. And this is my component along my y direction, right? So these two unit length vectors will give me the direction of these two components of that force vector. <coughs> now, I can delete these 1,000 Newtons here. Let's work now this 1,500 Newtons force. Let's decompose this also in the x and y direction. So I need to, starting with the horizontal direction, I need to project this force along the horizontal direction. So I will have this component here. 
sorry. This component here, and I need you to tell me now if this component is going to be positive or negative. Negative. Everybody knows why? Because this direction is opposite with my x-axis. So I need to say, I need to say now minus, now I need to project this on the horizontal, which is going to be 1500, right? Uh, sine of 60, right? This is my y component, okay? My component along the x direction. You can see the minus signal there. And now I need to project this one in the vertical direction to get this component. Okay? As you can see, same di direction as my y-axis, so this component is positive. Agree? So I can say plus, I can continue here, plus. The projection is 1500 times cosine of 60 and this is along my y direction that's why I put there my j unit vector and the last force vector I need to to deal with is this f vector so we are going to do exactly the same way so I'm going to project this force vector in my horizontal direction okay so this component is opposite with my x-axis. So we will have a minus. I'm going to say f. So f without arrow means uh, norm. OK? Or if you want, we can do this. Norm of f is fine. This is my, sorry. Norm of F is the length of this vector, or intensity. But in order to project this in the horizontal direction, I need to multiply this by, by what? Cos, cos of alpha, right? You agree with me? So this is my I component. Now I need to project this force along the vertical direction. I get this component here which is opposite with my y-axis, isn't it? So it means plus or minus? Minus. And then I have, again, the magnitude of f, or the norm, times now the sine of alpha. And this is my j component. OK? So this is. We decompose these three force vectors and we are adding them. And at the end, this addition needs to be equal to zero if we want the particle to be in equilibrium. And everything you are going to study during your period here at Brunel, not only Brunel, in engineering, right? Everything that you are going to study is based on the equilibrium. Everything is in equilibrium. Like this book, this book in this table is in equilibrium, isn't it? So the weight of this book is a force in the vertical direction going down. The table will react on the book with a force with the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction. So at the end, summation of the forces in this book is equal to zero. Book is in equilibrium. If the equilibrium equation is, not, is, not, is violated, then it means, right? If this roof here is not in equilibrium, it will fall down for sure. OK? So equilibrium will be the, the, the foundation of everything you are going to learn, not only in structural mechanics, but also in fluid mechanics. You are going to learn a fluid particle will move always in equilibrium. The, all the forces acting on a fluid particle will be, at every instant, will be always in equilibrium, right? So these equilibrium things we are studying is the foundation of everything you are going to learn 
so far. So if you don't understand this, it's a problem. So I recommend, please. All right, so now uh, what we have to do, and we are going to do it very quickly. Uh, let me just shrink this a little bit and its space. So what we are going to do now is I'm going to write all the components so I, I, can, I can say something like this. Summation of forces in the x direction needs to be equal to zero. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to group all the components with the i unit vector associated, okay? So the first is this one. I will have 1,000 cosine of 45 degrees. Second one is this one. All right, so I will have minus 1500 sine of 60. And the last one is this, okay? Which is also minus the norm of F cosine of alpha. And all these components along my X direction, they need to be equal to zero. So one equation. Second equation, summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero. Then we get, now I need to group all the components associated with my j unit vector. This is my first one, 1,000 sine of 45 degrees. This is my second one, plus 1,500 zero zero cosine of 60. And this is my last one, minus norm of F sine of alpha. And this also needs to be equal to zero, all right? And now, as you can see, we have here two equations, two equations for two unknowns, which are norm of F and my angle alpha, okay? You solve this system of equations. We are not going to solve the system of equations here now. But you solve this system of equations, you get your solution for this problem. So imagine you are working. After you finish your degree, you are working for a company. And your boss comes to you and says, oh, we have uh, a cable passing on this pulley here. But I don't know what is the, the mass or the force I need to apply on this cable to carry this load. Right? It's a problem typical like this one. Oh, that is easy. I can solve this. Then you go, you do the equilibrium of the pulley. You put all the forces there, like equilibrium of a particle. And then you apply the equilibrium equations. You get the force that your boss wants, right? You see? So these kind of problems uh, are very useful in practice. Now, you might be thinking on uh, what happened, for example. So we, for this force F, we decided to, to draw this force vec vector going downwards and to the left, right? Uh, and then based on this initial assumption, because you don't know F, you don't know alpha for this force, right? So I just defined the ar arbitrary direction for this force and arbitrary length or intensity for, the, for this vector, right? And then based on my initial orientation, what I did was, well, with this initial orientation, I use this minus here and this minus here, right? For this given uh, assumed orientation. So you might, you might be thinking, what if, what if I give this initial orientation for my force F and this angle alpha? Did I get a, a different result at the end or not? Right? Basically what I'm saying is, is do I get a different magnitude for this force at the end? Should I get a different magnitude for this force at the end? No, of course not, right? You don't know the initial orientation, so you assume. And then you go and write your equilibrium equations and you solve your system of equations for these two unknowns, right? If your initial orientation for F was wrong, then it means the signal you will get for F is going to be minus, it means my initial orientation was wrong. I need to correct that angle, OK? You know what I mean? So we are going to do this a lot. We don't know, for example, when we talk about reactions in 3D equilibrium of rigid bodies, we don't know the initial orientation for this reaction. So we need to assume 
And then at the end we solve the equilibrium equations, we get the answers, and the signal will tell me if my initial assumption was correct or wrong. So don't worry too much with that, okay? So I suggest we do a 10 minutes break, you guys to get some extra, and go, we come back in 10 minutes, all right? Okay. So one thing we didn't discuss was the, how to calculate the norm of a vector. So I want to do that quickly. So if you have, let's go back to our vector A. Vector A, okay. Uh, how do we calculate the norm of vector A? Okay, so basically what I want to get when I, when I calculate the norm of a vector, what I want to get is the length or magnitude of this vector, right? So I want to get the length. I want to get this length, right? So if I decompose this vector in my coordinate axis, I get my horizontal component, this one, and I get my vertical component along my y direction, right? Okay. So I can say this is my AX, this is my AY. All right? That's what we did so far. Uh, you also probably agree with me that this I can define this vector here, which is exactly the same as my AY, isn't it? You agree with me with this? Right? You agree? So, I can say that I have here, oh, the iPad doesn't want to collaborate. I can say that I have here a rectangular triangle you, you can see what I'm doing here in blue. You see this rectangular triangle in blue I have there? So the hypotenuse is the, so the length of the hypotenuse is going to be the norm of my vector A, right? The length of this one here is going to be the norm of AY. And the length of this is going to be the norm of AX, right? So uh, if I write, in order to remove this norm, if I just say AY, you know, without the superscript arrow, you know that I'm talking about the norm, right? So I can say, now, if I apply the Pythagoras theorem, that the norm of my vector A, which is the hypotenuse, so the hypotenuse square in the Pythagoras theorem is going to be equal to AX square plus AY square, right? So this is the Pythagoras theorem for that rectangular triangle. I have there in blue. And then I can say the norm of my vector A is going to be equal to the square root of AX square plus AY square. And this is how you calculate the norm of a vector. Right? <coughs> Another thing you can Another thing you can do is, okay, we have this vector A, we decompose this vector in the x, y direction, 
we have the components in the x and y directions, but what is the angle, for example, that this vector A makes with the horizontal axis? Okay, so what I'm saying is, what is this angle alpha here? What is, how can I get this angle alpha? So that gives me the orientation of my vector A. Well, you can say tangent of alpha is equal to what? Yeah, exactly, right? AY over AX comes again from the Pythagoras theorem, right? So from this equation, if you know the norm of AX and the norm of AY, you can get the orientation of my vector A. <coughs> Basically, you can get the angle alpha with the horizontal axis. All right? You see? So, we are trying to get all these informations from the vectors. We are trying to describe the vectors in a coordinate system, which is important, as you can see. If we don't describe the vectors in a coordinate system, we cannot get this AX, we cannot get this AY, so we cannot get anything, right? So, once we have vectors, we need to have a coordinate system to describe these vectors. And I take this to introduce to you another very important thing, which is the following. Imagine you have again vector A. Now, instead of having vector A, let's say this is a, a, f a force vector, F. Right? And then, as, as we have seen, I have my x, y coordinate axis to describe this vector. But I can have a different coordinate axis. I can have, for example, a coordinate axis a, B. Uh, this does not look perpendicular. So A needs to be perpendicular to B, of course. OK? So I have my force vector F there, which has a direction, has a magnitude. And I have two coordinate systems to describe this vector. So how do I describe this vector f in my x, y coordinate axis? Well, I decompose the vector in these components. And I get f, y, f, x. You all agree with me, right? But if I want to decompose my vector f in my a, b coordinate system, this one in green, what I do is exactly the same way. I draw parallel lines to this A and B axis. So I draw a parallel line with B and a parallel line with A. This component here is going to be my FA. And this component here is going to be my FB. You all agree with me? Are you following this? And as you can really see from here is FA, th this component FA is going to be different from FX, isn't it? You also agree with me from this figure that FA, the horizontal component, is going to be different from FX, the horizontal component in my XY system, right? Same thing for my FB is going to be also different from my Fy, isn't it? But what about my vector F? The, did it change? No, my vector F is still my force vector. It didn't change, isn't it? But the components in different coordinate systems, they are different. So you must think a little bit about this, right? And this is an area where you guys mix things and don't get it right. My vector f, which is my force vector, did not change. The magnitude of f did not change. The orientation of f in space didn't change. What is changing is the way we are seeing this vector. If I am in my coordinate system x, y in red, I am seeing, for example, from this direction, right? So it looks like this to me. So if you are the green coordinate system, you are seeing from a different direction, right? But this vector here didn't change. 
The, the only thing that change, is changing is the, 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 the view you are getting. You are getting a different view of this vector because you are in a different coordinate system, right? The components change, but the vector did not change. So this is something really very important. Uh, now, another thing I want to discuss with you is uh, we have been using we have been using this notation, if you want, to describe so this unit vector i, this unit vector j, to describe the vector. So th then, at the end, we we said that a is equal to a x the norm times the unit vector plus a y times the unit vector j along the y direction. So this is what we have been doing so far to describe the vector by its components. But there is another notation to write a vector a, which is some, I can write the same vector a, same vector a, in this form, ax, ay. Okay? It is very common for you guys to see this notation in many different books as well. So what this means is that this first term in this vector is the x component of vector A. This second term is the y component for vector A. Of course, if you, have, if you are in three dimensions, you will have something like this, ax, ay, az. OK? All right? So. That is another thing. Uh, now, I'm going to introduce you now two very important um, operations with vectors, which, which are the internal product. <coughs> Have you heard about internal product or not? Did you do this in A levels? No? You did? So only one did internal product? Two? Yeah. And then I'm going to talk with you about external product as well. So these are two operations you guys will have to know for this model. Two operations in vectors, with vectors. The result of the internal product, I'm going to write here, the result of internal product is a scalar. So we have the internal product of two vectors. The result is going to be a scalar. While for the external product, the result is going to be a vector. That is the main difference between these two operations with vectors. OK? <coughs> The internal product of, for example, vector A with vector B, we usually represent like this, A dot B. That's why sometimes the internal product is also called the dot product. OK? So the internal product, so A and B, they are two vectors. The internal product of these two vectors, the result is a scalar, like I said. And that result is given by the norm of A times the norm of B times cosine of the angle between these two vectors. So if you have, for example, vector A, vector B, this is the angle alpha. OK? That cosine of alpha is the angle that these two ma vectors make with each other. OK? All right? Now, look at this. Imagine, imagine that. Vector B is a unit 
vector. I'm going to put like this. For example, imagine this is a this is my vector b, and that the norm of b is equal to one. Is a unit vector. Okay. From the definition of internal product, let me shrink this a little bit. And let me move this. Yeah. From the definition of internal product, what we will have is so the internal product of A with B is going to be equal to the norm of A times the norm of B, which is 1. Right? In the, in the case of this example. Times cosine. So this is my angle alpha. Right? So basically this is going to be equal to. A dot B. So the internal product with A in B is going to be equal to norm of A cosine of alpha. Right? And if you look at this result, and if you go back to this figure, if you extend this force and this line, so look at this. If you project A along the direction given by unit vector B, you get this final vector here, right? And this length, this is a bit messed up here. Let me write this properly. So this length here is basically the norm of A, cosine of alpha, or if you want, is the projection of my vector A along the unit the direction of my unit vector B, right? Isn't it? Pythagoras theorem again. So the internal product of a vector A with a unit vector gives me the projector, projection of my vector A along the unit vector's direction. Right? Still a scalar, OK? So this is something that we did in the previous hour in this lecture, right? When we apply, uh, when we decompose basically the vectors in the coordinate axis, right? We are doing the internal product of vector A with my i and j directions. So I get the projection in the x direction and the projection in the y direction, right? So basically, in the previous hour, we were doing the internal product many times without knowing, right? Now, there is another way you can calculate the internal product. I'm going to write it here. So if you, if you want to do the internal product of A with B, if you define your vector, if you define your vector A by this vector, AX, AY, AZ, in three dimensions, if you define your vector B, BX, BY, BZ, then you can do the internal product by doing the following. You can put your vector A transposed. You all know what is the transpose of a vector? In this case, vector A is a, a column vector, right, with three rows. The transpose will be a row vector with three columns. You just rotate, basically, the vector, right? So you have AX, AY, AZ, dot product with now vector B, which is BX, BY, BZ. OK? And the result of this is, I'm going to do it very slowly. So look. 
I multiply the x component of vector a with the x component of vector b, so ax times bx, plus now the y component of vector a times the y component of vector b, ay times by, plus the z component of vector a times the z component of vector b. Okay? And this, this must be equal to norm of A times norm of B times cosine of the angle between these two vectors A and B, right? Needs to be the same thing, okay? So, if you want to practice at home, if you want to practice this at home, you can do something like this. Vector A is this one, 100, 200, 1,000. Vector B, uh, 50, 500, minus 200. So your homework is to do the internal product of A, internal product with B, by these two different methods, by doing this, vector A, vector B, all right? And by doing this, rule here, norm of A times the norm of B times cosine of the angle made between these two vectors. You need to calculate this at home. So the, you need to get the same result at the end. Okay? It's a good way to study. You do it internal product by doing two different ways, and then at the end, you should get the same result. That's how the best way to, to learn this, all right? Now, external product so if you have vector A and vector B, the external product of A and B, we write like this, A external with B. This is the external product, OK? The result of this external product is going to still be a vector, C, still a vector. And this vector C has Two very important properties. In fact, yeah, it has two very important properties. One is this vector C, which is the result of the external product, is going to be a vector that is perpendicular both to A and to B. Right? For example, I, I can give you a, a, an application of the external product. Imagine. You have this plane of this book, right? You want to know the normal to this plane. So what you can do is you define two vectors in this book. These red and blue vectors I have here in this book. You do the external product of these two vectors, red and blue, and the result is going to be the result is going to be a vector, this one black, that is perpendicular to these two. Right? This is very common to be used to, uh, um, for example, computer graphics schemes. Also in stress analysis, to get the, the principal stress, we are going to learn that in year two. We use the external product a lot. In this model, why do we need the external product? Because we are going to calculate the moment produced by a force. And the moment produced by a force is going to be the external product between two vectors, which are a position vector, this one in red, and a force vector, this one in blue. OK? So the moment produced by this position vector with this force vector is going to be a, a, a vector. The moment is still a vector that is going to be perpendicular to these two. So it is calculated from the external product, OK? Automatically. We are going to see that. 
maybe today in the afternoon or next week. All right, so um, the other property is the norm of C is going to be equal to this norm of A times norm of B times sine of angle alpha, which is the angle between vectors A and B. That gives me the norm of my vector C. <coughs> it's very similar with the norm of the internal product, right? The only difference is in, for the internal product, you have cosine of alpha. The external product, you have sine of alpha, OK? And this norm of C corresponds to the area of this parallelogram. If you draw parallel lines here, this area here, this area here is the norm of the result of the external problem, is the norm of C, given by this. This is the area of this parallelogram you have there, made between A and B. You make this parallelogram from A and B, uh, then you get this, this area. OK? Now, how can we, and now this is, how can I do the external product between A and B? Imagine again, A is given by this, AX, AY, AZ, the components along the X, Y, and Z coordinate axis. B is given by BX, BY, BZ. How can I do the external product of A, external product with B for this case? And the way I do it, there are many different ways of doing this, but the way I do it, I do it is, well, I write vector A first, so AX, AY, AZ, External product now with vector B, BX, BY, BZ. And the result of this, now, uh, please try to follow me now. So the result is still a vector. So we will start with the X component for this result vector. So I'm going to write the result in red. So for the X, for the X component, the way I do it is, I draw a line here, OK? And then I do the cross product. That's why also this external product sometimes is also known as cross product, because you do this cross product, AY times BZ minus AZ times BY. So I can write it here. You do AY times BZ minus AZ times BY. You see, I did a cross product to obtain my X component of this. Now, what about the, oops, what about the, uh, the Y component? So let me delete this. What about the Y component? So for the Y component, what we do is, <coughs> look now, I, I'm going to deal with the Y component. So I need to do the cross product of AX, BZ, and AZ, BX. But there is, for the Y component, there is a signal change. So I need to do AZ times BX minus AX times BZ. So I can write here. So I need to do AZ times BX minus AX times BZ. And this is my Y component. And last one we need to do is the Z component. So what we do is
For the Z component, I'm going to do now the Z component. I do this cross product AX times BY minus AY times BY, BX. So AX times BY minus AY times BX. All right? And as you can see, you have the result of ex an external cross product. You have still a vector with a X component, Y component, and Z component given this way. So this is a very generic form for the external product. I gave you two generic vectors, A and B, with generic components, AX, AY, Z, BX, BY, BZ. And I did the product of these two generic vectors. You can now apply this rule for any vectors you want, right? For the external. But I think this is not difficult to memorize if you do this way. So you have, if you are doing the X component, you cross the X, and then you do the cross product between the remaining components of the two vectors, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Or the second one, why did you phase the X? Yeah, because there's a signal change. Yeah, I mean, okay, for the Y component, you can also, if you want to do the same way, so let's, let's do the Y component on the same way we did the others. So for the Y component, so you have to do this cross product, right? So I'm, I'm going to, to, to do it here below. So if you do AX, times BZ minus AZ times BX. For the Y component, you need to multiply everything by minus. And then if you do that, you will end up having this. Okay? Only for the Y component. So don't, don't forget this, this rule, okay? No, two vectors, they will always make a plane, right? Right? Yeah. In the normal, yeah. So if you consider two vectors, always for... These two vectors, they make a plane, right? And the result of the external product will be a vector perpendicular to that plane. Right? Sorry? If they are not in the same plane, they will be in another plane. So the result will be perpendicular to that other plane, right? Not to the initial plane, right? So just uh, think like that. The result of the external product is a vector perpendicular to these two vectors you are using for. Okay? So because you guys behave extremely well today, <laughs> I was going to give you maybe a five minutes bonus. <laughs> So we have a lecture in the afternoon, all right? So unless you have any questions. So just one, one quick thing. This is very introductory stuff, right? We are going to do more practical things now. OK, from now on, OK? See you in the afternoon then. All right, so in the morning, uh, we have seen we defined what is a vector. We decompose the vector in a coordinate system. We define the components of a vector. And we also worked some operations with vectors like the dot product and the cross product, or the internal product and the external product, right? So I would like to start the afternoon with um, a very quick example for the external product. So imagine we have a 3D coordinate system, like this one, X, Y, Z, okay? So we will have our unit vectors, vector I, unit vector in the X direction, vector J, unit vector along the Y direction, and unit vector K, which is the unit vector that defines the Z direction. Right?
What I can do is, I can also define my vector, my unit vector i as being 1, 0, 0. You all agree with me or not? So 1 means it only has a component in the x direction, no components in the y direction, and no component in the z direction. I can also define my vector j as 0, 1, 0, can't I? Huh? So, if I do now the external product of i with j, external product with j, I can do the external product between these two vectors, right? What am I expecting to have from the result of this external product? What do you think? Zero. Why zero? But what did I tell you about the external product? The resulting vector is a vector perpendicular to each of them. So is there any vector here? If you look at this figure here, is there any vector? Yeah. K is a vector that is perpendicular to both i and j, right? So the result of this external product should give me a vector perpendicular to i and j, and that vector needs to be k, right? Let's see if that is the case. Let's do the external product. So i is 1, 0, 0. External product with j, which is 0, 1, 0, right? So the result is going to be a vector. Starting with the x component, I need to do this cross product, right? How much do you think is this cross product? 0 times 0 is 0, minus 0 times 1, 0. So this cross product is going to be equal to 0. So the x component is 0. Now, if I go to the y component, my cross product now is going to be 0 times 0, which is 0, minus 1 times 0, which is also 0, right? So I will also have 0 here. Let's see now the z component. I need to do this cross product. 1 times 1, which is 1, minus 0 times 0. So the result is 1, isn't it? And this result here is my unit vector k, which are a component only in the z direction, right? OK? Also, another thing, so let's say this is going to be equal to my vector k. Let's do another thing. Let's do the norm of this vector k. The norm is the square root of this component square, which is 0. I can put something like this, 0 squared, plus this component squared, which is also 0 plus this component squared. So the result of this norm is going to be equal to 1. Right? What did I tell you in the morning? Look at this. If this, the length of this unit vector is equal to 1, <coughs> if the length of this unit vector is equal to 1, I told you in the morning that the norm of the result of the external product is the area of this parallelogram, right? The area is 1 times 1 is equal to 1, right? So that's exactly what you have here. 1, the norm of the external product, OK? But this is a very simple example, just to show you these properties of the external product. Another thing I was asked in the morning after the lecture was, <clears throat> how do I know if the resulting vector, in this case my vector k, resulting vector of the external product, is in this, in this case is in this direction, and why not in the other direction, symmetric direction? How do we know that? So the result of the external product automatically gives you the correct direction. But the rule is very simple. Imagine, okay, imagine this is my vector i, OK? This is my vector j. So if I put my right hand 
aligned with I, aligned with I, if I rotate towards J, my thumb will give me the direction of K. You see? Right? So, for example, if I do the external product of J, external product with I, right? So this is J, this is I, right? So I need to align my end with J, in this case, rotate towards I. My thumb will give me now on the opposite direction, right? Okay? But you don't need to worry because when you do the external product like this, the direction of the resulting vector comes automatically. You don't need to worry that, all right? All right, so... <clears throat> Any questions so far? Yeah. Um, so why did you get uh, that zero, zero, one, uh, I'm not multiplying. This is the external product. And we saw in the morning, we have to do component by component. We have to do the cross products, OK? It's not just multiplying components, no. This is different. Okay? 